Welcome to the Pat Mayo Experience, a different type of show today. So if you're listening to this on the audio podcast feed, I've included the link to the video in it because it's something that if you're just listening to it in podcast form, it's probably not going to do you a whole world of good. Maybe you just, oh, maybe you're blind and you like to use this stuff and it's, you know, you're used to hearing it this way. If not, there's a lot of visuals that go into today's show. So I recommend you stop here. Thank you for the download. I always appreciate that because it goes a long way in helping the show. Uh, but you're going to want to check out the video version of this as I walk you through how I research for golf every single week. And I'm going to use an isolated example of Bay Hill and the Arnold Palmer Invitational, but the methods and steps that I use pertain to every single course. So what I want you to do, and I'm going to give some uh, DK bucks away as well. So there's two ways to get into a draw. One is smash the like button for the episode. Leave your DraftKings handle in the comment section and tell me your favorite way to research. Where do you start? your research every single week and what do you like to look at because I think that if we can pile up enough of these maybe there'll be some insights that I've overlooked that you do that other people can see and that even I can go see and go back and really try to adjust my process the other way to do it is leave a five-star review iTunes Spotify Stitcher your DK handle something nice about the show as always uh, that's another way to get into a draw for 20 DK dollars but really today what I want to do is tell you that when I go in cold to a tournament it's tough because I've been writing about these golf tournaments for like 10 years now that I do have a lot of bias in my mind and I do remember a lot about the courses and that does help me write about them a little bit but these are the steps that I take as I research both the course and the players that I like for each of the tournaments so it's not going to be put it this way you can follow each of these steps and do everything like I do and guess what I don't win every week so there's no just one way to say, hey, this is the way to do it, and you're going to win if you do it this way. That is not how it works. You want to develop good skills, good process, and then hopefully over time that you can be a winner by doing this. Over the long term, whether it be betting, whether it be DraftKings, I have been a winner as it pertains to golf. Football, not so much. Golf, I've done a lot better at, and this is the way that I do it. So if you want to improve upon my style, I'm just going to lay the groundwork and show you the tools that I use, where I look, and hopefully it'll help you out. So let's get to it. I always start by heading over to Fantasy National. This is the drop-down page, and you can become a member at FantasyNational.com. Whenever you want, just go to the page, become a member. Uh, the first few things that I like to do when I'm researching a new event is just take a look at what's happened in the past. So I'll check out past course conditions. I'll open up that tab, the course breakdown tab, the tournament history tab, and that's where I'll start. So let's go to the historic conditions. And we can see how this tournament has played in the past. We've seen that, wow, Bermuda greens, that's very easy to figure out right away. The green firmness, always pretty firm. The rough length has always been long. Uh, and the wind is, you know, we can get dicey, but generally speaking, it's pretty calm. Uh, we don't have any green speed numbers from last year. Uh, the tour guys just didn't put them in. But generally speaking, the year before, super duper fast, uh, faster than average the year before that. So even if we go back, average, lightning, fast, let's just assume that the green speed is going to be pretty fast. Uh, and then we'll look at the breakdown. So the first thing you can find at the top of the breakdown, and you can always change courses for whatever you want if you go up here. You just see how this course plays out. Um, you can see that the two of the three hardest holes off the hop are the first two out of the gate. So if you guys go bogey bogey, it's not the end of the world. Uh, even if you just try to do other things like let's just sort by rank. Uh, so if we look at it, we see you know these par fours. They're all pretty long, over 450 yards. All of the hard ones. Then you have the two par threes and the other one up top. So that is where it's really going to play difficult. The par fives playing super easy. The two short par fours playing super easy as well. I like to sort by eagles. Two, only to see that just as it pertains to DraftKings scoring, if you're thinking about outright betting, yeah, it would go a little bit of the way into it. Just, you know, you can get the extra, instead of getting birdie, you can get eagle. But are there eagles to be had on this course? Uh, as we see the 16th hole, the easiest hole on the course, you know, almost a 6% birdie rate. So even if you wanted to factor that in to your model a little bit, just guys that 
can get a lot of eagles uh, could end up with you know, the extra eight points on DraftKings versus three for a birdie. Yeah, that could go a significant way into determining whether it be a showdown slate, an overall slate. Just those extra points always help. So guys that are more prone to making eagle can probably do that on the 16th hole. The other ones just appear to be more of a crapshoot. Uh, you might get lucky. You might chip in. If you're super duper long, maybe you can generate an eagle opportunity, but it, there's not a whole lot there for the taking. Uh, so one of the other things that I really like to do, we can find the strokes gain breakdown, and this won't be available for every single course, only one that has historic shot strokes gain and shot link data. Uh, Bay Hill has it. Uh, that's the example that I'm using right now for this. And, you know, if you get to like the OHL Mayakoba, you're not going to have any stats for that. Unfortunately, there's nothing we can really do about it. So I always like to use this filter and look at the winners first. How did the winners get there on average per strokes gain? And you'll see that approach is just massively outweighting both off the tee and around the green as tee to green metrics. Uh, putting does mean a lot here um, for the winners, but that's going to be general for almost every course that you look at it's not often that you see a winner have a really poor putting week it happens from time to time it's far more likely that a player has a very hot putting week and that masks bad tee to green but as you can see as it pertains to stuff that's more predictable where you know, off the tee approaches and around the green are more predictable than putting week after week is that i tend to focus on the tee to green and what's really important from that uh, as i always like to say dustin johnson is always going to hit the ball 330 yards uh, Wes Bryant, despite being a really good putter, is always going to hit the ball 280 yards. But in any given week, he could be the best or worst putter in the field. And the same pertains to Dustin Johnson. Good putters putt poorly. Poor putters putt well on certain weeks. But if you're going to hit the ball and ball strike uh, at an elite level consistently, that doesn't really go away. So you have to figure out what's predictable and what's not. So putting, generally speaking, is not. Uh, you can look at Bermuda putting, and we'll, I'll show you how to do that in a second when we're doing some research or even fast greens and things like that. And maybe you can mix that in and weight it ever so, so slightly. But approach here, as we can see, is almost or is more than three times more valuable on the winners uh, than both off the tee and around the green. But that's just winners only. Let's take a look at the top five and see how things shake out. Approach still more than double as weighty as the other two T to green metrics. And when we're just talking about top five, we can see that the winners do separate themselves by putting, but the top five approach is actually more impactful than putting is. Uh, if we look at the top 10 finishers, how that works out, now we see that obviously the approaches are still good, but they're not quite as good. That's why they're not all inside the top five or the winner. We got those guys at the back end of the top 10. Off the tee becomes a bit more important around the green. The T to green starts to level itself out a little bit because there wasn't just a slew of elite approach shots for the week. And if we look at how the top 20, you see an even more it's a bit more leveled out. Obviously, still approach means more in almost any tournament that you go to. Strokes gained approach is going to be the most important metric. When Tiger was running away with everything in the early 2000s, yes, he was a good putter. Yes, the driving distance was key for him, but his approach game was so much better than everyone else's. That's how he ended up winning all the tournaments. So I like to look at top five. If I'm looking at pure upside, it, there's no real steadfast rule of what you can look at. And when you look at all these stats, the one thing to really keep in mind is that Every week is going to be different. You don't know how a player is going to play. Just because someone comes in with 27 straight weeks and rounds of strokes gained approach being in the positive doesn't mean that the 28th round isn't going to be in the negative. There's no foolproof plan for this. You just try to put yourself into the best situation possible with the information at hand. And if you want to go with your gut over what the numbers say, I mean, sometimes that works out. So there's no steadfast rule. There's no guaranteed way to win. I, I never want to make it seem like that. I, the one thing that I really do want to show is how I research things and how I come to the conclusions that I come to. And the conclusions that I come to and the research method that I use are going to be totally different than what someone else uses. So I just want to give you some insight to what I'm looking at here. So if we do this, we can see that ball striking is slightly more important than short game. Uh, strokes game, ball striking per fantasy national combines off the tee and approach. Short game combines around the green and putting. It's really that simple just to try to break it up. This is what I found really interesting. This makes a lot of sense here. Strokes gain per hole. Par threes, you're not going to gain a whole bunch of strokes as the leader. But we saw that the par threes are extremely difficult here. If we go back up to the top, sort by par threes, the second, uh, the second ranked, the sixth ranked, the seventh ranked, and eleventh ranked. There's a double percentage here, seven point or it's one point four percent. 
1.1%, bogey percentage, 25%, 21%. So there's ejections to be had uh, on a lot of these par threes. So I think that you can weight that a little bit. And one of the other things that you can look at too is right here in the yardage, 231, 215, 221. This takes some background knowledge to become accustomed to how long a lot of these holes are, but those are long par threes. To have three of them on one course, that's what makes them so difficult. So actually focusing on that range itself can be somewhat helpful. And you're not looking to gain a bunch of strokes on those holes and go like minus five for the week on the power threes basically what this is telling us is that if you can tread water on the power threes if you can just go one under for the week or you can go even for the week that's all you really need to do and capitalize on the power five and the easier power fours and not eject uh, as it goes along so the more things that we find in the course breakdowns you just see the average greens and regulation gained and i mean that that makes a lot of sense guys who mix miss the cut the the trunk slammers, as we call them. Uh, yeah, they didn't do so hot. <laughs> That's one of the reasons their approaches were so bad. They weren't hitting a lot of greens and regulations, so they missed the cut. Uh, sand saves at this course is pretty level, so that's not something too much to focus on. You need to be able to save out of the sand, but there's no real distinction between the winners and the guys that come inside the top 20. Over just general cut makers, yeah. So if you wanted to weight that a little bit, I can see that. Fairways gained. Hey, if you look at the winners, they don't hit all the fairways, uh, at least compared to the rest of the field. So it just shows me that driving accuracy at this course uh, is not the biggest deal. It's not something that you really need to wait all that much. Obviously, at a course like Bay Hill, where there's so much water, you don't want to be putting it into the water, but merely just hitting the fairway isn't the biggest thing. So here are some things to look at. You can find the whole breakdown. I mentioned that all those difficult par fours, 450 to 500, is an important range here. But this is the key one for me. Uh, and this does take some background knowledge just to compare it to different courses. And like I said, if you go back up to the top, you can go compare all the different courses that you want. But the average length of approach shot, uh, 200 plus, having that, that's probably around 33, I believe it's 32.3% I, when I did the calculation a bit earlier. That's a high number for approaches from beyond 200 yards. And that's going to factor in those par threes that are very long as well. And that's where a lot of it is coming in. Those are the most difficult approach shots. And it does seem like a lot of the field is going to be playing longer iron. So when we have a course like Pebble Beach, uh, you're only going to see the Pebble Beach data because there's no shot length for Monterey Peninsula or Spyglass, but you're going to see a lot of the 100 to 125, 125 to 50, and 75 to 100 because they're such short courses that wedges mean a lot there. Wedges don't mean all that much this week. If you're hitting a lot of wedges at this course, what this tells me is that there will be certain holes where you'll have a wedge in, maybe one or two. Other than that, the only wedge shots that are coming in are if you put it into the water and have to go to the drop zone. So that's not really something to focus on. I think that focusing on the 200 plus guys who are good at long irons and good at those approaches or what you want to do. Some more information in here. You can see how the scoring is distribution works, the historic cut line at this event, four over, four over, three over. Hey, it was minus one one year, and then it was back to one over and four over and two over. It's a hard course. Uh, you're going to have guys that blow up, but as we've seen from some of the previous champions, that guys can win at 18 under as well. Uh, you're going to need to be on this week because there's so much danger on this course because of the water that big numbers are abound. Uh, to go back to the driving accuracy where it's not as prevalent, it's probably because so many people hit it compared to your average tour event. Uh, and a lot of that has to do uh, this week with the water that sometimes that you have to take it a bit easier you can't just go full driver full out every single time only because you're gonna end up finding the agua that it's better to dial it back a little bit get it in the short grass and again that bleeds into why there's so many approaches over 200 yards and i, I want to make this general that it's not just pertaining to this but this is what i'm seeing from just looking at this page the greens and regulation percentage a bit low scrambling about on par with tour average uh, three putts about on tour, on par with what everything else is. But again, when I talk about that driving accuracy, this is where it comes in. The average tour event is 283 yards. At Bay Hill, it's 277. You're going to get other ones where it's wildly higher. Uh, somewhere like Kapalua, people are going to drive the ball a whole lot further than they do than a regular tour event. And again, this goes back to with so much water being around, guys take it back a bit, sacrifice some distance for accuracy. And again, that's what leads to the longer approaches for a lot of the field. Uh, greens and regulation proximity to the hole, a bit closer uh, or a bit longer than your average event, but not substantially so, only about three feet. So that's what I like to get just a general in 
I like to ingest what this course is telling me before I go into anything and before I start making any radical decisions. So we can just take a glance back at course history, what happened last year. So we can do this one of two ways. We can look back at the past five years in grid form. You can sort by strokes gain total. Turns out Robert Gamez sucks, uh, so you never want to take him. It's funny, when you look at total strokes gain total, which is everything, that's all three tee to greens plus putting, Tim Heron's been bad, sure. Gamez has lost almost 60 strokes the last five years. The next closest guy is minus 18.7, so that's kind of funny. So if we go back to last year, Rory, Bryson, Rose, have these guys historically done really well at this course? Well, let's see. Yeah, 4th, 27th, 11th. Bryson's been good in his two starts. Justin Rose has been good. You know, each of the last three years didn't do so hot there. Uh, Stenson comes in. He's a really interesting one, as we'll get into a little bit later on when we look into his player profile. But he's been playing so poorly coming into it that, you know, can you really trust course history? It's just a guide to see how these guys have done in the past. We start sort by positive strokes gain total. You'll see a lot of green versus a lot of red at the top because these are the guys that have gained the most strokes over the past five years. Um, but I, what I think is more important to really dig into, we'll open up 2018 and 2017. 2017 brings back some really bad memories because Leishman won and I had money on Kevin Kisner that year. So when a guy melts down who you have money on in the back nine, never a fun time. So once we get into this, we can just see an overall strokes gained breakdown of what happened. Rory, 10 strokes putting. That is very atypical of Rory. Uh, his final round at Bay Hill uh, in 2018 was just one of the best putting performances of all time. That's how he ended up storming the top of the leaderboard. As you can see, there was a players who were just much better on their approaches. If we just sort by approach and see who was good, we got Hollywood Hoagie coming up. Guy couldn't hit the ball off the tee, was finding a bunch of water, making up for it a little bit with his approaches. You lose four strokes off the tee, and I point one stroke putting and still come 26 that's not so bad uh, you got bryson luke list grayson murray taylor gooch brandon harkins so that's important to note like guys that have just played well here before how did they do it if we just sort by putting be like oh maybe these guys are somewhat unsustainable uh, is rory ever going to gain 10 strokes putting again in his career in any tournament and the answer is probably no uh, it's not to say that Justin Rose couldn't gain seven strokes again at a tournament or Rogers to gain eight and a half is, is a lot, but seven is in the realm of, is in the realistic range of outcomes. It's probably 5% to gain seven strokes putting in one tournament, but this is more the range here. The, the four strokes to, you know, minus whatever strokes, the, that's the typical range of outcomes that you're going to find. Everything else like way above is sort of an outlier and everything towards the bottom is sort of an outlier. Like losing eight strokes for Hudson Swafford is kind of crazy. Uh, Taylor Gooch, which lost 4.6 4. Uh, and gained 6.8, still came 26. So you see that it, that's on the extreme end of the spectrum. You can't really expect that to come out. We'll see how it was done uh, the Leishman year. Uh, you had Rory, uh, someone who you see, he goes from 10 strokes putting to minus 1.3, and that's really the difference. He comes fourth that year. He gains two or three strokes putting, and he wins because he had gained so much tee to green. Glover, every. It's funny that every gains a bunch of strokes on approaches and loses a bunch of strokes putting. But this is, just goes in to tell you the story of how they got there. Uh, there's not a bunch you can parse from all this historical data other than, hey, the guys with the approaches, even if they putted poorly like we see, you know, they still finish inside the top 10. Uh, Hatton, uh, shockingly enough, just if he was able to chip that week, he would have been fine. Hadwin gained a bunch and lost putting, ended up inside the top 10. Leishman, you saw, you know, he had the extreme outlier putting performance and was good with his irons. That's how he ended up getting there. Hoffman uh, came in second that year. Very good tee to green, and he was good putting, not great putting, ends up coming T2. So if you're going to rely on the tee to green numbers, that's where you really want to look at. Uh, so you just see the top one, two, three, four, five guys tee to green. They end up coming inside the top 10. Uh, if we're going to look at strokes game putting, those guys could all pop up there. But, you know, if you're going to be bad tee to green but gain a, stroke, a bunch of strokes putting, someone like Pat Perez here or Steve Wheatcroft or even Matthew Fitzpatrick, you know, they're not great tee to green. You see that reflected in the results, 17th, 56th, 13th. If that's all you're doing, it's always better to bank on those tee to green and ball striking numbers. Let's go back then to the tournament history. Actually, let's, we've, we've gleaned a little bit here. So if we just go back to our normal thing, you can do a lot uh, within this main stat engine too. So like I mentioned before, I'll just show you how to do it. I talked about Bermuda greens and fast greens. So the first thing you can do, you can just kind of look down to the filter side here, see how everything's going. Green speed, fast and lightning. We saw that pop up a bunch. If we just click on those filters. We'll see. 
That's everything assorted by just rounds on those. And I'm looking at the past 50 right now, so a lot of guys do uh, have 50 rounds of data. Terrell Hatton only has 49. And other guys that you're going to see that haven't been on tour for a while or have European data, there's no European data punched into this because their strokes gain numbers are so new uh, that you're just not going to find them. Horsfeld, 11. So when you see a sample like this, four rounds, or you know, 24 rounds is not the end of the world if they, I want to look long-term, but... You can just sort by strokes game putting. How do guys putt on this? Jason Day. Well, thank you very much, Jason Day. You withdrew, so it doesn't matter how good your putting is going to be. But Rogers, Affy Burnrat, Fowler, Laird, Kisner, Champ, all these guys, and even Champ has the smaller sample size than everyone else. Hostler, McDowell, Horschel, Siwoo Kim, Michael Thompson. They're all the players that have, at least over the past 50 rounds, have putted really well on these fast greens. Let's go to even further down. We can sort by 100 rounds if you want to get more of a sample to see the players who have played really well on these fast greens moving forward. So you have Ricky Fowler, Jason Day again, Snedeker, Patrick Rogers, Hostler, Reed. These are the ones that when you crank up the stint meter, they tend to increase their putting performance. It's Again, it's still putting, so it can, you know, it, within these 100 rounds, uh, you're not always going to get, you know, gaining a bunch of strokes every time. We can find it as a rank. We can find it as an average. So if we do it by average, Cameron Champ in his 25 rounds on fast or lightning greens is gaining a stroke per round. That's a lot. That's probably unsustainable the, far, the longer that we move this sample forward. Someone like Fowler and Day and Hostler have done this a little bit over time. Uh, if we just look at overall total, you can get that. Or this is a really fun one, rounds gained percentage. So if you're someone like uh, Hao Tong, you can kind of dial this up a little bit. I don't know why that's red. It really should be in the green. But on fast greens in his 16 rounds, he's gained strokes on fast and lightning greens against the field at almost a 70% clip. Uh, and that it's not just against this field. It's against the fields that they played. So I, I think that's a very important thing to look at when you're just trying to break down the numbers a little bit more. And all this just could be ancillary data. I'm just showing you how to do it. If you really want to ramp it up a bit, uh, you can go to Bermuda as well because we're fast, lightning, and these are Bermuda greens. Does that change anything? Well, let's see. Uh, Brian Gay is all of a sudden the best putter. But it's a lot of the exact same people popping up uh, over the last 100 rounds. I think if you do look at putting, the best way to measure it, if you ever want to add it into your modeling or whether you're trying to project anything forward, the longer sample putting you can find. Yeah, some guys can get hot with the putter for three weeks, but it's when you look at someone like, I'll just even look at Lucas Glover for a second, only because I know that he's had two really good putting weeks in a row. So if we go look at him, you know, we see his historic baseline. He's just awful on every surface. But the last few weeks, oh, look at the Honda, uh, 4.8 strokes gain putting uh, in the two rounds that he played at Pebble Beach, because that's all that's weighted from the AT&T Pro-Am, he gained four. But if we just look at you know, historic Lucas Glover over time, he's getting better. But then we see some just truly dreadful performances. So it's not atypical for Lucas Glover to go through a three-week stretch and then lose 4.8 strokes putting the next week. Even here, you lose 3.4, then you gain four, gain 4.8. So if you're only looking at 12 rounds, the putting numbers can really lie to you. Any short sample, especially in golf, can really lie to you over time. But if you just look at the average stroke gain summary here, you'll just see you know, over his last 164 uh, tournaments played, he's a minus putter. But the approach numbers seem, you know, they're better than they have been over historic rate, but he's been a positive player. The off the tee numbers seem about right. He's playing slightly better tee to green than he has because he's improved just marginally in the strokes gained. You just want to see positive progression, but also weighted against a baseline. And then that's where the visuals come in. If you're watching the tournaments on the weekend, it's hard to do because they're not always going to show you every player. But you know, does this guy look like he has a bit of confidence from around the greens now? Is he sticking it to four feet? And is he making those putts that it gives you some sort of back background to put into context what you're seeing. Is this a new type of thing, or is it like Ricky Fowler did at the Honda Classic where he was making putts from off the green? Like, that's not a sustainable way to move forward to consider yourself a good putter. Ricky is a good putter, at least by historical numbers, but that's just an outlier. It does look like these numbers right here, strokes game putting for Lucas Glover, are a bit of an outlier. Now, we said that about Webb Simpson last year, um, and if we just sort by Webb Simpson, we can go look him up. Uh, we know that he just all of a sudden became an excellent putter 
in 2018, uh, especially on Bermuda grass more than anywhere else. But if we went back and look at them this year, hmm, everything's sort of regressing back to not necessarily where it was, but it's finding a happy medium. Like the guy went on an absolute tear with the putter. He won the players with negative strokes gained approach and gained almost 10 strokes putting. It's probably not going to replicate itself again, but you saw a trend with him. He was able to keep it up, but he goes from 9.4 one week to minus 2.7, and then minus 2.2 in two of the next few tournaments that he has actually waited in. If you just go back and look at Webb, well, it's not all so great. Look at this stretch here for Webb. So it's just more to emphasize again that putting stats are rather fickle if you want to look at it, but it's something you can do. There's also a button here on Fantasy National called the Mixed Condition Model. So one thing that I'll do, it'll take any filter that you currently have. So it has 100 rounds, uh, it has Bermuda grass up, it has fast, it has lightning. Let's add that in. So if we click on it, we want to take strokes game putting uh, with fast and lightning uh, over the past 100 rounds. So let's call it last 100 rounds, Bermuda plus fast lightning. It's just a way to save some of your research. You just add it in. It's already added in, and we'll come to it later. It's up here if you ever want to go check on it. Uh, if we just click on it right now and see what we have, we just have one thing in there. Uh, and it's different than the actual custom model uh, that we'll get to in a second. So I'm going to unclick the filters and just go back to looking at everything normally. Uh, so you can go dig into the players and see how everyone's doing, but one thing that I like to do is create my custom model. I already have it custom created. You can also keep a running list of everything uh, that you have going on uh, for each of the tournaments, like uh, the one, one for Heritage when I won 20000 uh, in the $5. That was one that really worked out. I really followed the numbers on that. Uh, when I look at the CJ Cup, it was really good in the mid-range, but it was very poor. Like You can back test it. You really should keep, uh, whether it's you know, notes that you make yourself, figure out, like Memorial is just horrible. Mayakoba, great at the top. John Deere, I didn't trust the numbers that week. So these are just little notes that I put in for myself to make sure that when I go back to it the next year, that is this something I should trust? So this is the way that I've put it in right now. So I really weighted strokes gained approach, par five scoring, proximity from beyond 200 yards. Uh, there's no right way to weight stuff. And this is probably too many stats, to be perfectly honest with you. It's a trial by error sort of thing. And you're only going to get one tournament of data and one tournament's not really going to tell you all that much to tell you the truth, because if there's more wind this year than there had been in years past, then you know, if you had back tested the model against the past three years and it worked out really well, then all of a sudden you crank up the wind from five miles per hour to 20 miles per hour. Maybe these stats don't apply. There's so much variance as it applies to golf that you can't really kick yourself for getting one week wrong or even like put it this way. If you had a four, day losing streak in daily fantasy baseball. He would just say, hey, I'm having a bad run. I'll get it back the fifth day. But when you think about that in golf terms, that's a month worth of golf events. So if you think that your process is good, you have to stick to your process. If you think your process is bad, then you can start going in and mixing and matching or trying different things out. One of the fun things about this and that a lot of people... Uh, have got into. And I have some overlapping stats here, like approach and proximity go together, as do opportunities gained. Uh, I weighted strokes game putting just normally 5% in short game uh, in there as well. But you can add stats, uh, even if you just want to, like, uh, if people ever watch my show, you'll see the boards that come out. Uh, we have the stat board template, uh, the stats that you just see. These, these percentages don't mean anything. They're just there to put everything in the view that I need them. So if you just even want to weight everything at zero, for example, uh, it, you're not actually running a model for that, but you're just seeing that, hey, the, this is the order of the stats that I want to see instead of just seeing what comes up uh, as the default setting. Because the default setting is always going to be the same. If you just look at strokes gained every single time, it's going to go from strokes gained total to DraftKings points. And all of these ones in between are always going to be there. Even if you just run a different model and save it, uh, each time, and you can add the new one right here. Uh, you can just have the listing in the way that you want it. But I'm going to go back to Bay Hill and run this model and just see what happens. Uh, so we'll load this in here. And when you're compiling so many stats, it's going to take, I mean, it's not going to take hours by any means, but you're going to see how long it takes right here. I have it right now set to the past 100 rounds. And there's a couple things that you can do in here uh, once everything gets loaded up. Obviously, the longer uh, range that you have, if you put in 24 rounds, it'll take faster. If you put in 100 rounds, it'll take faster or slower. Uh, just over the past 100 rounds, here are the guys that rate out really well. So you have Bryson and Tiger, who WD'd from this event, but you can still see his historic data in here. And again, you can s sort it by rounds gain. You can sort it by total. You can sort it by average and just overall rank and sort that way. If you want to see who's the best in this range from over 200 yards, oh, Stenson, that makes sense. 
defense. Stenson, over the long term, has been really good. In the short term, he has not been, but maybe that's why he's played so well. Keegan Bradley is also another player that has really good course history. Obviously, Rory McIlroy won here a year ago and came inside the top five again the year before that. He's someone who's very good with the long irons. Uh, so if you want to back test it, one thing that you can do is go to the change pricing and go up here. You can just sort by all tours, all fields and whatever you want to do, but you can do go into the time machine, which brings you back a year to look at the stats uh, and the lead in form. So it's not the current stats that you'll look back in. It's the past 100 rounds leading into the 2018 Arnold Palmer Invitational. And you can do that for 2017. You can do that for 2016, 2015, 2014. So you can go back and look at the past five years and see the lead-in form. And then you can really test it. See, how would I have done last year? Let's look at the finish position over the past 100 rounds. Well, if I had ran these numbers, well, that's not so bad. Uh, obviously, it's going to favor the really good players, and it was a very stacked leaderboard last year. But over the past 100 rounds, you have Rory. He was fourth uh, in the stats that I had generated. Uh, Bryson would have been best in his lead-in form. He would have been second that year. Third for Justin Rose, third. Sixth, uh, Tiger Woods was fifth. He would have been second. Ryan Moore actually rated out quite well despite being a shorter hitter, and I had driving distance weighted, but he was still good at everything else. He was 19th, ended up coming in fifth. Then there's some big misses like Sean O'Hare. You're going to have this every single week, but you know, List always rates out well because he's such a good ball striker and such a crappy putter, and even just putting in putting can bump guys like that down a little bit, but if you had done that to Keith Mitchell at the Honda Classic, he would have never popped up for you so ball striking again is the key thing that you want to look at so i'd say near the top this is an elite field if we just start looking at some of the sleeper players you know, Leishman rated out well. Chapel rated out well. Kirk was 33rd in the model. I can guarantee you in terms of odds, he was probably around like 70th coming in for the week, but he was 13th in approach coming into that week over the past 100. And you can even do a thing called the, let's go here. Uh, we can go to the rolling report. So you can do a rolling report of any stat and it will just give you a custom range. So we'll go to the model again and just back test it to see if there was a certain range from 2018 uh, that really stuck out well versus the finishing performance. Uh, this is a really nice way just to see if did your model work in years past uh, if it didn't you can change it up or you can choose to not believe what happened if you think things are going to be different this year and really what that one was telling you is that the good players played well that that's no real revelatory information to anyone the good players are supposed to play well that's why they're 10 to 1 or 5 to 1 in the betting odds but you can sort it by past four rounds so if we looked at the past four rounds how did it do well Sean O'Hare actually turned up really well in terms of the short term modeling and then got progressively worse the more you look back at it but if you did past 12 rounds what did that look like well you know finishing position it says salary but that is finishing position 36 41 so that didn't really do much for us that didn't really tell us much if we go back to the past 50 rounds yeah that didn't do much if past 100 rounds that's when we start getting into everything uh, in terms of the modeling here uh, as it worked out for the 2018 so it's really tough to figure everything out as it works into it, but this is a very important thing to go look at, just to back test to make sure that you're going along the right path. Uh, again, with the mixed condition model, one of the things that you can do once we switch back to this year's tournament is if you want to say, hey, you know what, I like the past 24 rounds uh, for my model. We'll reload that back in. You can add the actual model so you can take your model power rankings and actually throw that in to what is happening in your mixed condition model if that's something that you really want to look at so after this loads uh, you'll see the thing come back up here again that yellow button uh, and this is the past 24 rounds so you'll have the uh, option of taking whatever whatever you want from up here so let's add and we'll go to my rank uh, and we'll say custom model pass 24 rounds and we'll add that in and maybe we want to also add strokes gained approach over the past 24 as well so we'll just go strokes gained approach and we'll call it sg approach past 24 and add that in too it just gives you more and more ways to look at things and you can absolutely become someone who is just stuck with analysis by paralysis as it pertains to this. But this is just some quick digging I like to do. I just say, hey, here's who's been good in approach lately. Here's been good at par fives. You can just go check that out. Just gives you more background information to build from. You're like, Nate Lashley, that's really weird that he's rating out so well. Let's go figure out how this has been happening. So we'll click on Nate Lashley. Uh, and there's a bunch of things that you can look at in here. You can drop it down. You can find out how he's played on you know, par threes, par fours by each range. You can find his DraftKings scoring, his driving accuracy. 
accuracy. I'll just look at stroke scanned right now. And one of the new features you can do is view player in the player engine. Uh, and this is really key when we look at it, because this breaks it down round by round. So the Puerto Rico Open, it has no stroke scan data. Uh, so that's really not going to help us out too much. But if we go back and we look at stroke scan approach, well, he gained uh, in his one round at Pebble. He gained in his, his final round at Pebble. He gained in his first round at Pebble. In the two weighted rounds at the Desert Classic, he gained on approach there and gained on approach there. In fact, he's been pretty good on approaches on a round by round basis. So that's why he's rating out so well uh, as we continue to go down. And you can search by anything in here too. If you want to go proximity and just see how he's really doing it. Oh, so uh, above 200. Wow, he's really gained on the field on the longer approaches uh, at least recently so far in 2019 he didn't at the RSM he was rather bad but even going back to before that Sanderson Farms really good from beyond 200 yards so this is just a new feature that you can look at to have more of a micro breakdown of the round by round I think Von Taylor was one that I looked at a little bit uh, coming into it because Von Taylor had been really solid on approaches um, over the past few events. And you can even see, like, his off-the-tee is never all that good, but recently his strokes gained approach has been hot fire. You just even see it in his numbers. So if we look at his, we know that he kind of imploded on Sunday at the Honda. What happened? Well, you can just see gained, 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 gained. Massive discrepancy for the fourth round at the Honda where he lost so many strokes. So is that one round an outlier? That's on you to decide. Uh, there's no real predictive way to figure that out, but I think I would take the, the current form of, wow, he's been really good with his irons outside of one round. I'll choose to believe that moving forward. So that's something that I just like to break it down from the micro view of these sorts of things. And again, you can figure out who's sticking it to opportunities gained. Opportunities gained means it is on the fringe or on the green inside 15 feet. We've called that a general birdie opportunity. Here's who's generating the most of those right now. If they make some putts, you know, if Scott Scalling's made a few putts, he'd be making a whole lot more birdies because he's giving himself a ton of chances to actually do it with these easier putts. He's just not making them right now. So before I go into anything else and how to go out of my lineups, that's just the stat base that I like to look at. And you can kind of dig into more players the more and more you go on. Like, you, know, you can look into Ricky Fowler. How's Ricky Fowler been doing? You can look into Hideki. How's Hideki been doing? And even check in on the mixed condition model. We'll, re we'll reload it, and we'll see what we got going on on the screen. Uh, so let's say if we just want to take these three things. We This isn't all you would ever want to put in here. Um, actually, you know what? I'll even go back and do something like this. Uh, if you just say past 24 rounds, you want to see a recent form and put that in. If we go to strokes gained, past 24 rounds, strokes gained total is going to tell you that's recent form. That's strokes gained overall, tee to green, and putting. So we can add that in. We'll go select strokes gained total. We'll call this recent form over past 24 and we'll add that in. One of the other cool things we can do, if we're looking at something like Bay Hill in particular, if you just highlight Bay Hill here and then click off, it'll just give you course history. Strokes gained course history just at Bay Hill. You can see how that's highlighted. Uh, if you want to put that in, you can say, you know what, strokes gained total, la past 24, course history, and mix that in. Of course, history, history. Yeah, that's close enough and add that in right there. So now when we look at the mixed condition model, we'll have all these different things to put in. And if we just run it, uh, we'll say the putting is worth 15. You can weight it however you want. So the custom model, the rankings that I came up with, let's say that that's something that's important to me because they're the numbers that I punched in, 40%. Strokes gained approach, we'll set that at 10% because it's already a part of that model. Recent form, I prefer that over course history. So we'll put that in at 20 and we'll put course history in at 15 and just see what happens. We'll load the numbers in and just see how the rankings actually work out. Uh, so we can do the mix. That's the, this is the rank from my model earlier that I ran, and this is the rank of the mixed condition model. So watch out for that moving forward. So Tiger would have been the best. Rory, Rose, Bryson, Michael Thompson rates out really well. The Gooch, who ended up withdrawing from this tournament. So he, he and Tiger, a lot of the guys that I would have really wanted to attack based on these numbers, didn't end up playing. Uh, Rafa Cabrera Bayo, number 12. Nate Lashley, number 10. Kokrak, who has been playing hot coming in and plays really well from distance, uh, as we know, is is someone that you know is that you could attack here it's just more ways to differentiate the numbers to really sort the numbers down to however way you want it i'm not saying that my way is right because it's probably not if it was i would win more but this is just the way that i use these tools to help me in my research so again when we go back so everything's sorted by bay hill right now we can go back and go back to all courses 
one thing that I found, uh, if you find corollary courses, and you kind of have to dig around leaderboards to find that or distance of everything, but Honda was one of them. So PGA National, I always had correlated with the Heritage and the Sony Open. So there's Heritage, Harbor Town. So we click on that and we hold down the command key. I don't know what it is on PC. It's probably the you know, command, I guess it's still what it's called, control potentially. So we'll take that. We'll get YLI for the Sony Open. And then we'll get PGA National if that's just a cross reference that you want to make. And you know, I'm not saying that that is absolutely right, but that's the way that you can cobble together three courses if you really want to look at three courses. And it loads in everything there, and you'll get strokes gained total over the past 24 rounds. Obviously, this isn't the same field, so it's not going to give you the same guys at the top, but that is how you combine courses together to look at just those three in isolation. I know a lot of people have asked me about that, and that's how it goes. I find it's interesting to look at. It's You, you have to take everything with a grain of salt as it comes down to it, but I think it's just interesting info to have. So what I like to do next before I start making my picks or do anything is go to Josh Culp's site, futureoffantasy.com. He has the Fantasy Golf Act. It's up here at the top, and you can just scroll down, and you can get some more information, some more context to the different courses, because I think that just looking at things from statistical basis is a nice base to give yourself. It gives you the information. Now you need to figure out what those numbers actually mean. The best way to do that is actually to watch the golf to see if what you're seeing on the page actually matches up to what you're seeing on the course. That's always the best way to try to disseminate some of this information. But if we click on the Arnold Palmer Invitational, we just get a little bit of, uh, just a little bit of info. So it's, you know, 7,400 yards. You can find all that stuff on the breakdown. You have the architects, bunkers, you have the hazards, the green sizes, and just even the context of, hey, it's a bit larger than your average size green. It's good to know. Uh, Josh indicates his tournament angles. You find your previous winners, your 54-hole leaders, your 34. But what I really like is this. Important interview quotes. Just players talking about the course uh, and how that can kind of give you a bit of insight to what they're seeing. And, you know, sometimes players don't they're seeing everything through their lens. So what Mark Leishman says versus what Tiger says versus what Henrik Stenson says is all could be completely different, but it just gives you more different angles to look at. Uh, another thing that I like to do to give myself some context is go back and look at what I wrote last year. If, if you write about golf, always sign to make your notes, but just giving yourself uh, here's who was in the field last year. That's good information to have. Just how did this shake out? Why did these guys end up at the top? Was it a weak field? Was it a strong field? Uh, what did I think of it last year? How were my picks last year? My picks last year were pretty terrible at this event. Hey, Luke List, not bad. Kevin Chappell finished inside the top 10. Why did I get on those guys? Read that back and see if I made mistakes, if there's room to improve. What was I looking at last year? Does that translate over to this year? If I look back at those strokes gain numbers and after all my research, does it match up with what I thought last year? Most of the time, yes, it's going to match up or I'll change something ever so slightly. If I look at the key stats, yeah, those are basically what I was on last year. So... I think that you can go back and assess what you've done. I have like 10 years of columns that I've written up on all these courses. And I try to improve upon them in each subsequent year. The other thing that you can do, and I think this is the big leap when people always look at different things. This is pgatormedia.pgatorhq.com. It's a stat site and info site for media members, but anyone can go sign up for it. And this is where you get your recap. So I'll click on Arnold Palmer Invitational. This is all the information for the week. There's some cool shot link data. The problem is not every course and shot link doesn't provide this. So, and it comes really late in the week. So this comes on like a Thursday. So if you hear me talk on a Monday show, I'm not going to have access to this, but it just shows you how Rory did what he did last year, uh, putting inside 10 feet. Oh, Rory was a perfect 54 for 54. Generally, if you're perfect inside seven feet, you're going to win tournaments. He was also number one in driving distance versus the field. So it's just a cool, different way to look at it. Easiest par fives on tour. Oh, there's number 16 at Bay Hill. People are just dominating that one. Highest birdie or better, better per percentage from the fairway last season at number 16 it was the fifth easiest hole on course in that number so it's just more information but if we go back to the main page here one of the things that I really like to use this for before I start making picks or finish up any decision making that I have is going into the previous season so let's go to 2017-18 and let's go to the Arnold Palmer Invitational and one thing that you'll find here is, oh, there's notes at the end of each round. And I like this to tell me a story because I remember what happened from watching it and betting on it and playing DraftKings lineups on it. Now let's open up all of these. 
and you'll see, this is how I come to a lot of my first round leader conclusions as well. It's not always accurate, but uh, here's what happened at the end of the first round last year. Stenson, Wise, Gooch, Walker, Ricky Fowler, Bryson DeChambeau, and it gives you a bit of information on how they got there. Like, oh, Stenson only needed 20 putts to complete his round? That's kind of crazy, despite the fact that he, well, here's maybe why. He only hit 12 of 18 greens in regulation, meaning his short game was pretty good. He was probably putting a lot of chips close, and then just one putting. It doesn't mean the strokes game putting was out of control, but whenever he had a chance to make birdie, he did make birdie on those putts. How did Aaron Wise get there? How did Jimmy Walker get there? There's just good nuggets in here to tell the story. Who had the bogey-free rounds? And you'll find that for the second round and the third round. And then even when we go to the fourth round, you'll just sort of get an overview of what happened during the course of the tournament you'll get all this info about the top five on the leaderboard it's just it's more insight again the more information that you can put into your mind helps you try to weed out what's right what's wrong what could be predictable and what's not it's not always going to be relevant but the more you can immerse yourself in this i think that the better it is it just gives you more context to everything that's going on so that's basically how i research then i start my writing and then you know i start fooling around even more on here and like oh who's great been great at stroke skiing approach on these on, i'm back on all courses fortunately, uh, over the past. Why Hideki? What's Hideki been doing? And then I can do my deep dive on Hideki, and I'll do this for 50, 60, 70 players in the field. Uh, but I'm trying to approach it from a content perspective, too, rather than just picking my teams. I'm trying to figure out, hey, I know that people are going to ask me during the week, is this guy a fade? I'll have to write someone up in my call. I'm like, here's a guy I don't like that's at really high odds. Why don't I like that guy? Well, if I look at the you know, DraftKings pricing of everyone, and I sort by the top. That's almost the way I go into Like, if I want to look at Rory. So let's take a look at Rory here. Is, is Rory someone I want to be fading? Eh, well, it probably doesn't look like I want to be fading Rory. He's been playing really well tee to green. When he's been putting, his finishes are off the charts. And even if I start by Arnold, Arnold Palmer Invitational, well, he's been really good at this tournament over the years. Probably not a guy that I want to fade. And then you start making your cases for your players based on this. So I, I always try to come at everything with an informational perspective. But... You know, if what my waiting tells me is not really what jives up, like in full disclosure at Bay Hill, Jason Day did not rate out well for me, and I bet on Jason Day anyway. And what did Jason Day do? Well, he didn't play poorly, and he didn't play well. He hurt his back and withdrew. There's always going to be circumstances like that that are out of your control, and you're just not going to be right. Once you realize that you're not going to be right every single time, you just want to be as right as possible as often you can, then you start working from a process perspective over a results perspective, and I think that's really the key. So that's my process as I start to research for my articles, make my lineups, figure out the players that I want to bet on. Um, right now, uh, in full disclosure, I'm doing this during the first round of Bay Hill. If you click on in-tournament stats, uh, you're going to find that you have this oh, strokes gain leaderboard. Uh, just uh, I'm going to do a deeper dive video on this. Uh, I like to look at it as total instead of rank, and uh, clearly there are some guys that are still on the course, so you kind of have to take this with a grain of salt until you get everything uh, off, off the page for one full round of con full round of stats because the longer people play because these are counting stats at some point as well that the more approaches you make well the higher you're going to be in strokes gained approach but I think it's really interesting to look at is hey Rafa was seven under today he blew everyone out in the first wave by two strokes how did he do it well his approaches were on point. Justin Rose's approaches were on point, but the guy couldn't putt. He lost almost a stroke putting. He was one under despite being second in the field in strokes gained approach. When I start to think about head-to-heads and showdown slates, this is what I'm looking for. So I'll, even if I'll sort by strokes gained ball striking. I do think that approach is more important this week, but uh, uh, ball striking and tee to greens always what you want to do. It's just as a rule of thumb, try to find players that are high in ball striking and bad in putting. Even if you want to sort by crappy putting and just to see like, do 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 oh, Sung J.M., terrible putting in the first round the ball striking has been shockingly good that's a guy that's probably going to rebound in round two and even if you look at strokes game putting and go the other way well keith mitchell i mean keith mitchell is the ultimate ball striker slash bad putter but hey in the first round of bay hill he gained the most strokes of anyone putting and lost strokes ball striking that's a guy that's likely going to regress now appy barnrat's a really interesting one he gained almost three strokes putting which would put him on pace for just under 12 for the tournament which is not going to happen uh, as we went back and looked at those numbers earlier the ball striking was really bad now he popped up in both fast and lightning strokes game putting historically and all of those on bermuda so maybe he can sustain the higher putting but this would really worry me he is not hitting his approaches really 
really well. That could just spell disaster. So sorting by bad putters and who's gaining in ball striking and sorting by good putters and who's losing in ball striking is just sort of a rule of thumb to look at when playing three balls and head-to-head matchups. And one of the things that you can do in here I don't know who the three balls are, particularly for tomorrow. I haven't really, really researched that, but let's just say that it was Sung J M. Sung J M was playing with Keith Mitchell uh, and Dominic Bozzelli. If I just favorite those guys and I sort by my favorites, I can just kind of see. And you can do this for all the three balls once they're posted or the head-to-head matchups. Just give yourself a view of it and be like, oh, these guys suck at ball striking and are great putting, and M isn't. Like, tomorrow, if these three were in a three ball, which they're not because they're not playing together, obviously, because one guy's still on the course and the others aren't, but if they were... In this situation, the books generally tend to lean towards the guy that's currently winning or just the bigger name. Mitchell, who's leading all these guys and coming off of a win, is someone that would probably be like plus 130 in a three ball. Bazelli would probably be because he's Bazelli like plus 250. Im would probably be like plus 190, plus 200, something like that. I'm just making these up as I go. But that would be a clear play on to me at two to one odds that he would reverse everything and these guys would regress and he's close to them anyway. That would be a play on spot for me. I try to look for big distinctions in between putting ball striking when taking a head-to-head contest or a three ball does one guy really stick out as an outlier in terms of positive regression and then do Keith Mitchell and Dominic Bozzelli clearly by this because of the putting and it's not to say that Keith Mitchell won't come out and gain four strokes putting tomorrow it's just really unlikely because a he's historically a bad putter and b this is just a lot of strokes to gain in one round putting like it's very hard to replicate that round after round if anything when you think about putting everything just kind of goes back Back to level. So if he lost like a stroke and a half tomorrow and the ball striking is still bad, instead of shooting one over, he might shoot like three, four over. Where if M gets the putting back to normal, and even if he regresses in ball striking a little, but if let's say he's just even, he's going to be like minus three for the day, minus two for the day. So that's the way that you look at it when you think about head to head stuff. But I'll do a deeper dive on that. It's a great way to pick showdown players as well. Uh, and by the favorites here on Fantasy National, if we just go back to the beginning, Um, and you sort by whatever it is you want. So your DraftKings players, if you favorite them, um, let's see. No, the showdown slate has not been entered yet by the time I'm recording this. It's still too early in the day. Let's say I wanted Rory. Uh, I did pick Dave for this, but now that I know that he's withdrawn, I probably won't pick him. Pick Phil and Howell, and we'll just randomly select a whole bunch of people here. And we need a whole bunch of people to, amongst the price ranges, to, to make the generator work. And you go to the lineup generator. So you see the number of lineups you want to generate. Obviously, uh, this is actually, this is what you can generate here. So you just generate lineups. I put on a max salary, a min salary, and shared liner, shared players for per lineup. Uh, just I weighted everyone at twenty percent just to see what it spits out for me here. Once I place all these people in. And once that actually generates, you can move your shares around. I probably don't have enough players to generate 20 lineups, to tell you the truth. Yeah, we were unable to build all your lineups because I don't have enough players. Uh, It did generate 19 of the 20 lineups, though, if you really wanted a concentrated core. But sometimes if you don't have the requisite number of people amongst all the price ranges, it won't be able to let you do anything. But let's say, hey, I wanted way more Patrick Reed than I wanted Phil Mickelson. You could take your Phil Mickelson shares. Uh, Actually, I've generated so few player lineups that I really can't move people around. But if I wanted to move hey i have nine lines with hatton nine with burger let's say i love daniel burger which i don't i can make the swap to four pretty easily and you can tinker around like that if you want to you can even go custom do them in here by pressing the x and adding the different players in that you want so that's always something to look at to go into it and you can always look at the simulator the simulator is not a a masterpiece by any means uh, as it pertains to really predicting anything out but all it really does is tell you here's how players have played on these length of holes that's how the fantasy now National Generator Simulator does it out. Um, You can just see, sort by, hey, player wins. If we ran this a 1,000 times by the simulator, it's saying that Rory would win 111 times. And you'll just see guys like, you know, Mark Leishman pop up. Hey, there's Nate Lashley. And these, this is the column that confuses people. So odds versus market odds. The odds in this are actually what the simulator would tell you. So 111 out of 1,000 is 9 to 1. The market actually has Rory at 7 to 1 on betting odds. So he's actually a bit overvalued, even based on the fact that he would win uh, just over 9% of the time. So that's kind of crazy to think about. Um, Tiger withdrew, obviously. 
I mean, when you look at the big ones, like the Gooch, he would have withdrew, but let's say he had played, you know, he's 140 to one in the betting market, 52 to one by the simulator. Nate Lashley, 175 to one, 40 to one by the simulator. So it's not a, a thing that you just go and bank on, but it's very interesting to see, maybe even from a top 20 perspective, if you're looking for sleepers, that's the way that I really like to choose to use the simulator because the top end's always just going to have the top guys because they're the top guys. And if you simulate everything true, the cream would rise to the top. That It's always interesting to look at the players that you don't expect to see, like the Nate Lashleys of the world. Uh, even as you go down a little, like Charles Howell, really, even in this stack of the field, Charles Howell, he is the top 20 master, so maybe that does make sense. So it's just more information, again, to give yourself a chance. And that'll do it on the Pat Mayo experience. Thank you for tuning in. I hope this really helped you out and really either cuts down on your process or gives you different things to think about or maybe some tools that you didn't know existed or know how to use that now you can put those into your repertoire. Maybe you can improve upon, like I said, what I've done uh, and make it more successful for you now that you know how to use them and where to look to find some of this information. The other one thing that I do is I have a notepad at home uh, with each of the tournaments every year. After the tournament, I try to scribble down a few notes to inform myself for the next year's tournament. If there's a mistake that I made along the way, it's just good to have that information and track the results as you go on year by year by year. Because if you're doing this right now and you've watched all the way through this video, chances are you're probably going to be playing these same tournaments again next year and the year after that. So it's just really good information to have. If you want to get into the draw for 20 DK dollars, what you do is like the episode, leave your DraftKings handle in the comment section along with some of your favorite sites and research methods that you use for golf every single week or leave a five-star review on the audio podcast with your DraftKings handle and something nice about the show and you too are in a draw for 20 DK dollars. I'm Pat Mayo. Become a member at Fantasy National like me if you want to use a lot of these tools. I highly recommend it. Uh, it's just a very, very easy way to get all your research done in one place like I just showed and that'll do it. Good luck to all of you during the golf season. I hope really this has helped. This is really why I wanted to do it. A lot of people ask me about this and yeah, I have let you in behind the curtain now. Uh, now all of my tricks of the trade are out there. So hopefully you can put them to good use. I'm Pat Mayo. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time. Experience. Experience.